Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can support the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. If you like this podcast, tell a friend. Or give it a mention on your favorite social media platforms. And please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That might just inspire Apple to promote us a little. Now you can support the Virtual Memories show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Welcome to a slightly late installment of the show. I know last week I mentioned that I was running in a 5K on New Year's Day and wanted to get the episode live in case I had a heart attack during the race, so I'm very sorry if I worried you by posting this one a couple of days late. Uh, but this week's podcast is part of a blog tour where the publisher asked me to delay the episode for a couple of days to fit into the schedule. So... No heart attack, but I did crush my previous 5K time, which uh, makes me feel pretty good. Especially since it's my birthday this week and I am closing in on 50. No, you, you didn't have to buy me anything. It, it would have been nice, but but that's okay. Anyway, um, quick rundown as far as my exciting work life goes. I got down to D.C. last week for Congressional Swearing-In Day. Uh, I got to see some Congress people and staffers that I work with. Um, also bumped into the governor of New Jersey on the train to Washington and, and schmoozed a minute or two with him. Uh, next week, I am supposed to visit the FDA for a quarterly meeting that we do. But my uh, my colleagues and I are a little concerned that no one's going to be there and the lights are going to be turned off because of the uh, the government shutdown. We'll see. So um, in podcast news, I have been following my New Year's resolution and trying to line up some heavy hitter guests for 2019. Um, there's been kind of kind of a good feeling. I've made a lot of progress here. Um, I don't want to name any names until they're confirmed, but but I've been hearing back from publicists and there's interest with a couple of them and there are books coming out and this would be a great opportunity and it's kind of great getting that dance going. I really hope to, to bring you a bunch of uh, fantastic episodes in 2019, starting with this one. Um, because you've waited long enough for it, let's get down to it. Our guest this week is the author Jerome Charon. He has a wonderful new book that just came out from Live Right Publishing. It's called The Perilous Adventures of the Cowboy King, a novel of Teddy Roosevelt and his times, which... Sounds bombastic and melodramatic, and the cover is actually made up in that sort of old-style pulp novel way, which all fits, but the book transcends all that. Jerome's an incredible, an incredibly varied author. He's done historical novels and crime fiction and, and graphic novels and essays and a, a treatise on ping pong and a lot more over nearly 60 years in, in publishing. With this new book, he... um He's done historical novels before where he, he kind of attaches not a modern voice, but a, a certain sensibility to historical American figures. And in this one, he, he manages to recreate Teddy Roosevelt from his early days, from his childhood, up to the, the brink of the presidency. And he, he manages to blend the the mythology of, of Teddy Roosevelt with with history and this this sort of lush and, and flowing narrative. It's um 
it's amazing. And there's, like I say, there's theatrics and, and melodrama and heroics, but he also does a wonderful job of, of laying out Roosevelt's historical moment and where America was and the, the forces that govern New York City and, and New York State and, and the country. Um, and there's these wonderful sections that are in the Western frontier that, that are just fantastic. And he really just kind of evokes a different America, but one that's that reflects the America we're living in now. So I strongly recommend The Perilous Adventures of the Cowboy King uh, from Jerome Charon, C-H-A-R-Y-N. Um, it is from Live Right Publishing. It's, it's awfully good. Now, as I mentioned, this episode is part of a blog tour for the book, and that means that every day we'll see new reviews, Q&As, and other content about The Cowboy King. Um, that said, I can pretty much guarantee this is the only stop on that tour where you are going to get Jerome's perspective on Rajon Rondo's usefulness in the modern NBA and whether LeBron James should have gone somewhere else besides the Lakers. I don't think any other reviewer or interviewer is going to hit on that. We did. Um, if anything, this was an episode that managed to hit on historical fiction, crime novels, comic books, and the modern NBA, which... If you get down to it, there would be a perfect podcast for me. This would be it. So um, I had a blast with Jerome. We talk about getting together again when his next book comes out. Um, we'll see. This is uh, pretty much one of the most entertaining episodes I've ever done. I get more animated in this one talking about basketball than possibly any of the previous 300 episodes we've had. But back to the blog tour. You can check out all the venues and dates for the blog tour by visiting, wait for it, perilousadventuresblogtour.com. All one word, spelled just like it sounds, no spaces. Um, there'll be a link in the show notes for this one, as well as on the webpage for the episode. So that way you can go and check out all the other reviews and other stuff about the book and about Jerome. Now, also, as part of the tour, you can win a copy of the new book, as well as Jerome's earlier novel, I Am Abraham, a novel of Lincoln and the Civil War. So to do that, you need to either leave a comment on this episode's webpage on chimeraobscura.com slash VM. That'll be the, the page with all the show notes. Or email me at groth18 at gmail.com, and I'll announce the winner in next week's episode. Now, as caveats go, um, Jerome was in a creaky chair. There was New York City noise. And he kind of moved off of the microphone a few times. So I try and balance the noise level or sound levels. But, you know, sometimes he's going to fade a little bit. Also, I should give a caveat to this intro. I haven't told you enough about how great Jerome's other books are. He has had an amazing, lengthy career, as I mentioned. The Isaac Seidel crime novels are just mind-blowingly good. I've read the the first four. Uh, they, they tend to get collected as, as a single group. And um, phew, they just get better and better and better as, as each one goes by. And his graphic novels like The Magician's Wife and Billy Budd, KGB, are, are just awesome. His essays are fantastic. He's an amazing writer, and I'm awfully glad we got to spend some time together. Now, here's the first paragraph of Jerome's bio. There is a much more extensive one covering his awards, his praise, his achievements over the years at jeromecharon.com, and I'll spell that at the end of the episode. Jerome Charon is an award-winning American author. With more than 50 published works, he has earned a long-standing reputation as an inventive and prolific chronicler of real and imagined American life. And now... The Virtual Memories Conversation with Jerome Charon. To start off, what drew you to Teddy Roosevelt and to this novel? Well, I, um, you, you have to remember that, that throughout my entire life, Teddy Roosevelt was seen as a kind of cartoonish character, you know, the guy mm -hmm. who charged up... Uh, San Juan Hill, and then I I read a book, you know, uh, Edmund Morris's biography of him, and I fell in love with his father. His father was such an extraordinary man. I mean, 
he was born into wealth, but he really wasn't that interested in wealth. And what moved me the most is that he started a home for newsboys. You know, newsboys in the 19th century, um, they had no place to live. And even if they made money, they were robbed. The police robbed them. And uh, he built a home, a shelter for them. And more than that, every Sunday night, he would put on his evening clothes and have dinner with these boys. I mean, it must have made them uh, feel human in a world that completely dehumanized them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you understand Teddy Roosevelt if you understand his relationship with his father. He never wanted to let his father down. Mm -hmm. And the kind of moral leverage that he had w w was always... What would Braveheart, you know, my core, I call Braveheart, what would he have done under these circumstances? And that was his moral compass. And, uh, and that's why, uh, even though Roosevelt was a man of his times, with the prejudices of his times, he also had this uh, tremendous desire to really help the disadvantage, and that that was what moved me the most. Was it then the, the image of the father with the newsboys that sort of was central for you for starting this? Yes. Or was it the having a father who set a really high level of standards? I just wonder, well, given I, the, the I father had relationship such a, such a poor relationship with my father yeah, that's what I'm that, that uh, um, seeing how... He was shaped by his father because uh, he had asthma. And as you know, the book begins with a ride uh, uh, after midnight to, to sort of cure an asthma attack. And, um, and then the father picks up a stray kitten and they bring it to a shop the next day. So, um, and his father died when he was quite young. The, the image remains with him throughout his entire life. I mean, he did have lapses. He did, th he did things that he shouldn't have done. But on the other hand, uh, there was always that sort of in invisible hand on his shoulder, you know. And he most often knew what it was he had to do. Yeah. Yeah, how much research went into it? Beyond the, the Edmund Morris book. Oh, I read everything. Yeah. You know, and I'm not, I'm lo only looking for details. Yeah. You know, for example, if you go to, you know, Cuba, I mean, what was it like to be there? What was their encampment like? Let's say particularly when they returned from Cuba um, and they were forced to stay on, in Long Island for a month. What was it like? And... Also, the pet uh, cougar Josephine, I mean, stories about her were very, very hard to find. So I research uh, as much as I can. I want to know the history, and then I sort of throw it away because I, I don't need to follow the historical path. I mean, I just, I need to know it. Mm -hmm. you know? And you do a great job, the way you frame it, in terms of, of that sense of place yeah. in each each location they are. Those things seem completely lived in and, and real. Well, that's the most important thing, is that the sense of place, uh, without that, um, you, you, you as a reader are not there. You want to transport the reader into this magical world as if he or she, you know, were there with you. Uh, and the uh, almost phantom-like relation that the writer has with the reader, because after all, uh, you may be writing it in a way for yourself, but you also want it to be read. You know? hmm. And do you feel that carries through your other fiction, or is that really a hallmark of the historical work in, uh, in particular? Um, I, I've always done research, but... Uh, these are very different kinds of historical novels because uh, um, in most historical novels uh, it's about his, you're dealing with historical events and, and I'm really dealing with traumas and wounds whether it's Emily Dickinson or, or Lincoln 
or Theodore Roosevelt. Do you see a common theme among them, or is it that that sense of internal I, trauma I, that you're seeing? I, I feel a common theme in that they were all wounded in some way, and their wounds defined them. They were very different people. I mean, Emily Dickinson was a poet coming from very upper-middle-class circumstances. Um, and, you know, what kind of life did she, did she lead? And, and I, I, I felt the, the critics never, you know, gave her justice in that she... Uh, the, it's only recently that we underst understood that she got up at 5 o'clock in the morning and had to prime the stove... <laughs> And she was not this recluse. I mean, she had a lot of work to do, and she worked very hard, you know. So that there is a common bond, uh, a kind of web that ties them together, though they are all very, very different. And, and Lincoln was one of a kind. We, we will never have another man um, occupying that role again. I mean, he was without vanity. He had no vanity at all, and that's what made him great. My day job involves lobbying down on Capitol Hill right. periodically, and, and one of the early conclusions I came to was, oh, they're all sociopaths who know how to get people to vote for them yeah. in a popularity contest. That's how you end up with this atmosphere and this culture down here. So, yeah, I, I can imagine times are very different. Yeah. Um, how did your, your views of Teddy Roosevelt evolve over the course of this? You know, um, how did you move from the, the cartoonish or the melodramatic, I guess, into... Well, um, I, I remember even even in the books, the, the, the early books about him said that he remained a child of six years old, you know. Yeah. I mean, so in other words, even the early biographies uh, didn't do him justice, but when, remember, I, I, I end the book as he's just about to become president, but when you think of uh, his ability to get the Japanese and the Russians at, at the same table and, and find a solution uh, for that war, I mean, I mean, he had an amazing sense of what to do at the right moment. I mean, whether it was going up San Juan Hill, of course, there's a lot of mythology attached to that mm -hmm. and a lot of untruths. But still, I mean, uh, there's a moment in the book, you remember, when all his troops, they're in Long Island and they go, you know, they, they walk sort of in a circle around him and sort of, you know, say their goodbye to him. And that was an actual event that actually occurred. And I, I was very touched uh, by that incident, that they loved him as an officer, because he was not like any other officer. I should actually amend it and, and not say, how did you get rid of the melodrama? Because there is mel there are melodramatic elements in this, in a good way, uh, yeah. in terms of a character who has that level of, of mythos behind yeah, him. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I call him the, the first American superhero in that he was... Uh, um, you know, he was afraid of nothing. You know, he, he uh, you know, when in the charge up San Juan Hill, he had to get his regroup his troops. Uh, of course, when he writes his autobiography, I mean, it, it's filled with the prejudices of his time. I mean, you can't get, you know, it, it's very, very difficult when you try to so so called quote unquote modernize someone. And I, I try to take them out of their time in a way and, and uh, show them as they might have been, as they could have been, as they should have been. You know? yeah, how much of a tension is that for you? The, the historical, uh, you mentioned doing the historical research, but, you know, the historical facts as they, as they are versus, you know, what makes a good story. I know there was some kerfluffle with the Emily Dickinson book, but... You know, is that a how much of a, a tension is that for you as a storyteller? Well, um, I mean, I guess people were, you know, first of all, I'm a male writing in a female voice, sort of as a kind of um, grave robber, I was called by, but 
that's the book that so many people come back to is is the Emily Dickinson book is is because uh, you know it, it's an impossible feat to capture someone's voice you know and uh, I'm finishing a book on J D Salinger and a novel and who would ever think of writing a novel you're writing a novel J D Salinger? Salinger okay I'm just yeah. making sure I'm because yeah. I saw the a book over here on the table about yeah. him so okay yeah. just want to make sure that I'll be back next year for for another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. And who else would, uh, you know... Where's that bravery come from? I'm fearless on the... I'm afraid of everything. I'm yeah. afraid of walking out of the house. I'm afraid of not being on a plane, but getting to the airport. Everything frightens me, but writing does not frighten me. You give me, you know... Um, I read one of Salinger's stories, uh, for Esme with Love and Squalor, and um, it really is one of the best stories in the, in the English language. And then I saw a documentary that Shane Salerno made uh, on him, uh, that he was an intelligence officer in World War II. And this was a completely different Salinger. This was not a Salinger that uh, we remember, you know, or that, you know, the myth, the official myth... Uh, was very different from the actual person. So, in a way, it's not that different from Teddy Roosevelt. We start out with the cliché, you know. Lincoln is full of clichés. I mean, Emily Dickinson, we have the idea of uh, uh, of the recluse. Uh, these poems almost spontaneously generating yeah, as opposed and, to a person. And, and, and the human being who was experimenting in the same way. I mean, I compare it to Van Gogh. There was just a kind of explosion um, so that uh, I found that uh, I, I wasn't drawn to the Salinger who, who returned to, to 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 live in New Hampshire, but I was drawn to the Salinger who was a, a counterintelligence agent and had a breakdown and married a German woman and brought her home. And we don't hear about his first wife, you know, that's not... And we don't hear much about his sisters, so I was able to find out certain details about his sister, and she's a very important character in the book, you know. But that's another life, yeah. another... Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that one next yeah. year, but yeah. I should ask, did you ever get to meet Salinger? No, I never did, and I did not admire his later work, but I loved his stories. I grew up with his stories, and, and again... They had such a sense of time and place that no other writer has ever been able to evoke uh, the New York of the 30s and the 40s in the way that, that he was able to do. You know. Tell me about your New York. My New York was, was a chaos and bedlam. I grew up in the South Bronx uh, um, at a time of violence and... and uh, there was no no culture whatsoever. I, you know, how did I end up being a writer when I, the first novel I read was The Sun Also Rises when I was about to go to college. And um, I registered as a pre-med student because to sort of keep my mother happy, even though I knew I was never going to be a pre-med student. So the first day I arrived, I changed it to an English major. But then... I, you know, we all make terrible blunders, and I wanted to join the literary magazine, you know, which would have been helpful just to be around other writers. But when they give you an interview, the, the, the guy who gave it uh, was so condescending that I worried that uh, he would take away my desire to write. You know, he would just put me down, and I, I would mm -hmm. feel... Uh, so uncomfortable that I, I didn't join the magazine. But I should have. I should have resisted um, his condescension because it would have been fun working on a literary magazine. It doesn't seem to have impacted your literary career too badly, though, right? No, that didn't. But it would have been very helpful to learn about, you know, how how to put out an issue of a magazine. Later, I did work on a literary magazine, but... Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't have the courage uh, to get past this unfortunate person. 
Was that generally insecurity coming from a, a non-literary world into... I don't think it was insecurity. I, I think it was um, an understanding that um, the desire to write, because remember, I always considered it as an apprenticeship. You You learn how to write all your life, and that he would have taken away um, my music, mm-hmm. you know, my feeling. You know, you were learning, you know, you, you read James Joyce, and he's the most musical of all writers. And I, 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 maybe I made a mistake, maybe I didn't make a mistake, but I couldn't afford to be put down so early when I, I don't know, I hadn't read anything, and I was lucky. I, I went to Columbia College because it was four years of reading books. Yeah. You know. There are things we look back at as, well, trying to imagine how we had the time and energy to focus on that many books in, in that oh, but, short you of time. Know, but, but you have to remember that for me, I mean, I grew up, there, there were no books in my yeah. house. I had the first volume A of an encyclopedia. It was probably given to my parents, you know, to get them to buy it. And um, the thing that gave me, I know it's going to sound crazy, the, si- the thing that gave me the most pleasure was having my first bookcase. Yeah. Because I could put all my modern library classics in there. and I read them all. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, you know. And at that time, you were defined as a reader if you read War and Peace. Well, I did read War and Peace. I should ask, Dostoevsky or Tolstoy? Who do you favor? Um, well, that's a very interesting question because I I, I was a, uh, a Russian major. Oh, true, true. And um, you have to put Turgenev in there. And of those three, the greatest stylist <laughs> is Turgenev. Yeah. You know, and he comes out poorest in English. You know. Why is that? Just the idiom. I don't language? know why. You know why certain books are translatable and others aren't. You know, mm-hmm. so Dostoevsky is better in English than he is in Russian. Though he's a great writer. I mean, I'm not taking, uh, but he's a very sloppy writer. Mm-hmm. And 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 uh, Tolstoy is a very simple writer. I mean, but but he had the, the gift of. Uh, of being a soldier, and so when he wrote about war, there's there's no one else like him, you know. But Turgenev had a kind of poetry that doesn't translate. Yeah. We don't read him. Yeah, Chekhov I only got turned on to a few years ago. Chekhov just... translates quite well because yeah. he has a very simple style and, uh, uh, mm-hmm. and he's a great story writer, you know, and and I was supposed to be a teacher of Russian, but I I realized that uh, um, how would I write, you know, being, uh, you know, when when, the the best job I ever had was being a substitute teacher. I lived in a room that was like a closet, and I didn't feel deprived at all Mm -hmm. because uh, I would teach once or twice a week. And I would teach at Music and Art, which is where I went to as a student. And if you were always available, that is, if you only taught at one school, you would be called first. Yeah, So makes sense. Because they could rely on you, yeah. you know. And so I was, if anyone got sick, I was always there. And then the teacher I was replacing for one day had a heart attack, so I stayed there for the entire semester. And I loved the kids, and they loved me, and I was called into the principal's office, and he said, you know, you know, we don't give tenure to anyone. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to get a job in the city system now, but I'm going to make an exception, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hire you. And I looked at him, and I realized that you know, in, 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 in that second, I had to decide, because this was going to be the rest of my life. I mm-hmm. loved these kids. I would have stayed there until I was 90, you know. But I realized, you know, it's five classes a day. I mean, that's 150 compositions every other week. Where would you have time to write? So when I said no, he couldn't believe that I was refusing him. No one would have refused that job because, you know, they were not giving tenure, you know. And he said, well, I'll make the exception. 
And I don't think it was the wrong decision. I mean, I would have had a great time being there, but I never would have been a writer. You know, you, you have to face failure. Um, you have to face making mistakes. And you need the time. And um, I wasted a lot of time, you know, studying Russian and, and learning that language. And, uh, and at first I was going to be a high school teacher. And then, you know, um, I was lucky in that um, it was the era when um, universities were first accepting creative writers, you know, novelists. Yeah. So I had the choice of going to either Stanford or Berkeley. I should have chosen Berkeley because I would have been happier there. It would have been the mid sixties, which this would have was, been this was this was in nineteen. You were born sixty two. Yeah, this okay. is in sixty two. So just yeah. on the cusp of both, things. Yeah, both schools. Um, and I was hired at Berkeley again, and I again refused. I'm pretty stupid. <laughs> you know. I don't make very good decisions. Yeah, it seemed to work out okay for you. Well, at this point, it, you know. it's worked out the way it's worked out. I mean, I'm still fortunate. I'm with a woman that whom I love, and uh, and um, I'm doing what I want to do. And um, could you have been more successful? I mean, are there things that you could have done that would have made you more successful? Probably, but you know, my own feeling is. Um, I'm not a publicist. I'm just a writer. That's all I can do. You know, I can't the, do anything other than that. The more of you guys I interview, and this is around the 300th episode yeah. we've done, the greater I understand how much luck plays into this, how much you can have luck the best novel is, out there and the publicist quits a, is, a week before the book comes luck out. Luck is, yeah. uh, is 90% of anything. I mean, mm -hmm. and, um, and and part of that luck is persistence. Sure. If you you know, in other words, you ha you have to be groomed for failure and still. I, I wasn't going to give up. You know, I would have still written. Um, I hope, if I hadn't been published, this is what I wanted to do. I wasn't interested in anything else. There was nothing else I wanted to do. Do you remember the first time you saw your name on a book? Yes, but, but more important than that was the first time I saw a magazine. I was going to ask if that was more important. Yeah, it was commentary. Yeah. It was, uh, that was my first publication. And I, from that story, I had six publishers who were interested in publishing me, and I invariably chose the worst of the six <laughs> publishers. But he was the best editor, you know. Yeah. So, and, and he... He said, I wrote a story, and, and he said, we'll publish a novel or your stories. You know, and he, in other words, he was very, he wanted to publish me. So I, uh, I didn't have an agent or anyone, any, you know, and um, I, went, I went with that publisher, but they were not a good publisher. Anyway, look. Yeah, yeah I just it, wonder what that, that feeling of seeing your name that first time, knowing that that was the... It's very strange because I also worked on television and when I heard my words on the screen mm -hmm. uh, and saw the actors performing them, it gave me no pleasure whatsoever. I had no pleasure. But when I do a graphic novel and I see my images translated into the artist's world, it gives me an incredible amount of pleasure. That's why I do them. And I want to get back to that, that idea yeah. of collaboration and graphic yeah. novels and, and writing for TV. Because, you know, I was an artist. You know, I was yeah. at music and art, but I was the worst artist in the world. You know, I In terms of figurative painting or...? I had no talent. Yeah. I had no talent whatsoever. I wish I did, you know. I would have done my own graphic novel. Nowadays, you can get away with, you know, scratchy... It doesn't name, matter. I know. I it know. doesn't matter. I, I don't have the gift, and I yeah. don't. I did the cover. I did one. Uh, I did the cover of one of my novels called The Tar Baby. Mm -hmm. If you know, just look it up on Amazon, yeah. you'll see the cover. You know. But I want to ask. You mentioned writing being an apprenticeship. Yeah. What's gotten easier for you? No, it's nothing is easy. It's, it's what's hard. harder for you. <laughs> it's, it's just as hard and. Uh, 
And remember, I'm not reading as much. Uh, when I was much younger, I read everything. I, I read, you know, and, and when I, for example, there's a writer, William Gass. I don't know if you know his Yeah, I you wish know. I had, had the when, chance to sit down I with him. When I first yeah. discovered him, I said, my God, this guy is... Uh, was that around Omen Setter's Luck or later on? After no, this a was, uh, this, this was um, before Omen Setter's Luck. This was uh, in the heart oh, of yeah, the Oh, yeah, yeah, the first country. collection. Yeah. Yeah. And, and his essay on the color blue, I mean, uh, you know, because at that point, I, I, I would read the best stories of the year, and that was one, you know, I was reading everything I could, you know, because uh, how do you learn, you know? And he was, to me such a great influence, but he wasn't a storyteller. No. He was a musician. Yeah. You know, yeah. and there's a difference. I am a storyteller. I need to tell a story. I need, you know, um, I need to have a narrative. Uh, and the narrative is like a river, you know, that it has to keep flowing, you know. And you can, you can take diversions here and there, but it's... It's always about a story and, and the music of that story. Yeah. You and Gas and a guy I used to publish around the turn of the century, Paul West, um, yeah. all had the curse of being called a writer's writer. Yeah. That's something it's you... It's not a curse. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's not a curse at all. Um, because one doesn't know how history will perform. For example, I've written a whole series of crime novels, and I hope to be working on uh, an animated series based on those crime novels, and if that animated series is produced, those crime novels will be published again, you know. And, uh, it, it, you know, if you're alive, anything is possible. <laughs> if you're not alive, well, you know, people have to search the graveyard, you know. Do you feel you get your due as a writer, or respect from peers or an well, audience? Does that matter to you? Respect from your peers ma does matter, but you, you need readers. If you don't have readers, you can't, uh, you can't function. And, and um, as I say, I'm not very good at... Uh, I can speak. I can speak very well, but I, I don't believe in... Uh, in self public publicity, you know. Um, for a while, the, I lived in Paris for a while, and, and there I had uh, I had an audience. I mean, um, and it was a very very different world, you know. It was on television all the time, and uh, um, and their writers are respected. So if there's a political problem, and you know, I did a a, col a column on. Um, on America for Charlie Hebdo mm -hmm. for for almost a year, and that was fun to do. You know. What initially brought you to France and to Paris? I always wanted, even as a kid. Don't ask me why. I mean, when I was, uh, when I say don't ask me why, I mean I, I really don't know. I couldn't give you the answer. I know that in junior high school, when everybody studied Spanish, I studied French, and so there were about three people in the whole class. You know. Because uh, everybody wanted, it was much more practical to study Spanish. Sure. But uh, um, I wasn't very good in, in, in listening. You know, I could write, the, you know, it was very hard for me to... Um, to do conversational? To do the yeah. conversation, you know, to, to, I, I don't know why. And, um, of course, when you move to, to Paris, when you move out of your culture, you're lost, you know, in a way you disappear in your own culture. And also, language shifts so tremendously that uh, when I came back, I couldn't understand what people were saying, you know. I mean, even, let's say, basketball, because I'm a great basketball addict, when they said, well, he's in the paint. Well, we never talked about that. <laughs> he's in the paint, he dropped the dime. Yeah, that, that was a new one for me in the 90s that yeah. was, okay, I guess that's an assist, but... Yeah, yeah but, yeah. I mean, where does it... How do you get... The, how did, where does it come from? I don't mean this in a racist way. Black culture, yeah. um, especially from the 90s onwards, hip-hop culture, inventing new parlance and seeing it proliferate yeah. and promulgate throughout the rest of the culture has been a yeah. pretty amazing phenomenon. But yeah, oh, a lot yeah. of that stuff comes from 
you know, just that need to come up with a new term for something because you're trying to. But make a name. but you know, I, it, it was amazing. I, I felt like uh, you know Rip Van Winkle just waking <laughs> up and <coughs> this is the game. And I love Le, J, LeBron James. I, I mean, yeah. I mourn his being in in, in L A. Uh, in L A. because the games are so late. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, and. He's just not on a good team. You know, It'll get better. Know. My take is, and no, this ahead. is just two hoop heads, he's been to the finals eight years in a row. He needs a break. It's a long season. He's done eight postseasons that have gone yeah, but all Gil, the way. I know, I know. He ain't that young. He's not, he doesn't have that many good years. Yeah, what's weird, though, if is... If they get someone like Trevor Ariza, if they get... Oh, a, he just got traded to the Wizards. Oh, that's yeah. too bad. I know that that was one who uh, you know would have made sense. Yeah. They'll they'll add stuff. I don't have any faith in Magic Johnson's ability to assemble a team, but yeah, I, I think LeBron, when they finally figure out, and put, when Rondo comes back, I mean, that I will just, make a tremendous. I thing. just don't see a. I, I figure this NBA, you need guys who shoot threes. It's something Greg Popovich talked about disparagingly. Yeah, I just heard that. Yeah, yeah. you just looked at who made the most three pointers, and that's who's going to win. Um, but also. Having a team that can go to the basket because you can counteract the threes when you have a very when you have a running team. Sure. And someone like Rondo has such a court sense that having him back. Uh, well, it's sad he's not going to make the finals, um, and he's going to be a year older. He doesn't look any slower. That's you know. the thing. Uh, apparently, there was some. They they track every player now by little devices in their uniforms yeah. to figure out their speed all game long. LeBron moves the slowest because uh, in the entire league because apparently his staff figured out don't burn extra energy. Yeah. Do the things when when the focus of play is on you. Yeah, that's that's great. But don't chase. Don't do things that'll burn. So apparently he's got something about conserving energy that's kept him fresh at 33 years old, which to us is mind-blowing because we've all seen players play yeah, as they go over but, but also, um, they can't win unless he scores 50 points. Oh, yeah. They just don't have the team. Right. They'll, they'll add something. But You're you know. more optimistic than I am. I don't know if this year will be it, but, you know, they'll, they'll start putting it together. We've already seen the seams starting to split at Golden State. So... Um, but this is great. I had no, no idea but you were a hoops guy, you, too. So. <laughs> you, you say the seams are splitting at Golden State, but, but they're bored with the season. They're just yeah. waiting for the finals. But That's we know very that different. sometimes that catches up with you. Sometimes that means one guy takes a step he shouldn't have taken, pulls a groin, as, yes, injuries, as Steph Curry did. Injuries, that you know, the only thing that will stop them are injuries. But if they don't have injuries, there's yeah. no way that... Uh, oh, they're built to dominate the league, but... Yeah, it's um, and what what he should have gone to Philadelphia. I mean, if he wanted a championship, no, he he won three already. He beat the greatest team around in in the seventy three and nine Golden State. You know, I I think his take was I've I've made my legacy. I'm going to live in L A. and advance my my. Overall, the other, the other side of my career. I know. To us, that's a, a disappointment. big mistake. I, honestly, when he left for Miami, I was down on him and thought it was, you know, a cheap thing. And coming back to Cleveland and, and doing what he did there kind of changed the entire perspective. I think a lot of people had of him that was okay. He's he's doing his own path. It doesn't have to be like the Magic and Larry days. It doesn't have to be like Jordan. No, I you know. I know that, and and it's also impossible to compare him with with any other player. I mean, he, he what 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 one can say is that he is the giant of this particular time, mm-hmm. in that he can play any position. He can play center. Yeah, he'd be a perfectly good center on any team. Uh. And he can play point guard, he can play power forward, he can play small forward. And uh, he ignites a team, but, you know, you, you you need the talent around them. They used to say at Cle- in Cleveland that it was LeBron and four guys named Mo. You yeah. know, now it's LeBron and four guys named Joe. But it's pretty, yeah. it's not, you know, except for Rondo. Rondo is a great ball player. What a... What was your 
intro to especially professional basketball? Did it come up in the, the 50s the Knicks, into the 60s? When, Knicks? In the 60s, yeah. when, when the Knicks were a, a great team, I, I, I really... The Busher, Bradley, Willis. The Busher, Bradley, and they were such a smart team. And I never thought they could integrate Earl the Pearl. I thought, my God, what a mistake. You have such a savvy team, and you're getting this kind of magician, and they were able to work him into the team. They won another championship. Um, they were, of course, lucky that that seventh game when Willis did you? I don't. Yeah, remember. Willis came back. Willis. And, yeah. w- w- Just thought, I, I, I'm from around here, so yeah, yeah. That, that's held in, in when, mythical regard. When he came back from the locker room, people were crazed. Yeah, they were crazed. You know. I just couldn't imagine being. I was born in '71, so yeah. it was after that first championship, and too small to to know the second one. But, but yeah, um, watching the game, especially from the Ewing era onwards, that uh, that kind of. I remember. I, I was never a player. I didn't have the talent or or even the interest. It just to me, it, and also I became very much involved in ballet. I mean. I was living with a woman who was a member of Balanchine's troupe. Oh, wow. And um, so I went to the ballet all the time, and I happened to live on the same block with Balanchine, and he'd see me with her, and he would give me such a dirty look. <laughs> didn't want any of his women... You're you know, polluting his, his, exactly. his company. Yeah, I just did one a few weeks ago with the guy who did the biography of Edward Gorey. Right. And Gorey was a massive... Oh, sure. Uh, I remember thing. seeing him there, too. Yeah, is that New York, your your golden era, your personal golden era for the city? Well, to me, uh, I can't say golden era. It, it, it was a kind of golden era because you had experimental theater, you had repertory houses for films, and you had Balanchine. I think, he, to me, he's the greatest creator of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. He took me... He made ballets that were utterly musical, and also I loved Allegra Kent when I first I, when I first saw her dance. I mean, she was like uh, under a spell, you know. And I became friendly with her, and I just love her. I mean, she uh, she had a kind of magic that uh, she was possessed, you know. It. it uh, I just was riveted to her when I saw her dance. I mean, it was amazing. What drew you to ballet? Was it the girlfriend, or were you already a, a ballet aficionado? No, it, 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 the, the, the the woman I was living with was was a member of. Um, and that's what drew you in. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. she got me. You know, she got me. Let me. I could go to the ballet every day. You know. Yeah. I just and mean, when, did you have an interest in it prior, or was it? I did have an interest prior to it, but not in the same way. I did have an interest prior to it. I was with another woman who loved the ballet, and we went there a lot, but we didn't go every day. I mean, and also, when they trained in Saratoga, I went up, uh, and I was there all summer long. You know, I just think he he's the most extraordinary artist that, that I have ever seen. You know. Yeah, that's in the Gory book. The the vibe seemed to be people said, you know, it's like if you were living in Vienna and Mozart was composing, why would you not go? You Balanchine was in New York. You, you had to go to see, to see anything it. like him. And yeah. when he sits in the last row uh, of, uh, and isn't with his nose twitching, the last, uh, you know, at the end of the auditorium, and they're dancing for him. Every single one of them on the stage when he's there, they're, they're, you know. Did you ever write about that scene? Um, I haven't. I did do a novel. Uh, I, I don't think it was quite successful. I, I never published it about a ballet dancer. Um, and I have written about Allegra Kent in, uh, in a book about Emily Dickinson. Uh, but... Um, the you know Cornell's corn Joseph Cornell did a series of boxes on Emily Dickinson and he also was was friendly with Allegra, so I wrote about Allegra how she danced and what her dancing meant to me mm-hmm. in that book. Did did you feel you could capture that again uh, that whole writing about dance? I'm, I'm not, not sure. Joke, but, I'm yeah. not sure. I, I mean, I, I might have been able to do it better, um, and I did it. 
in the book, but I don't think the, the novel worked. So tell me about what we're talking about, collaboration and I call them comics. We can call them graphic novels or bande dessinée, however we want to put it. But your work in that space and what it's like handing something over and trusting another another creator to... to... Well, I always work with the best artists, the best artists sure. that I could find. And uh, and it happened, that there was a, a magazine called A Sweever, which means, you know, to be continued. And they reviewed one of my books, so I wrote a letter to the editor. I was still living in America at that time, and I said, look, I'd like to do one. Can you think of an artist? And he came up with Francois Bouc, and then we did La Femme de Magician, I mean, The Magician's Wife, and it won the prize at Angoulême, you know. Uh, and then we did another one, and we got into some kind of fight. I don't know. It was my stupidity, you know. I, I, I should have realized that he was touchy on a particular subject. And, uh, I asked the editor to decide, and the editor decided in my favor, but he said he would never work with me again, and then many years later we did work again. And in the intervening time, you end up with Lustal and Lustal Munoz and, and, and guys like that. And both yeah. wonderful, but they were never as successful as the books uh, with Book, I mean, because he has a sense of lyrical movement that... Uh, He's a great storyteller. How do you write for that medium? Did you tend to script or gift. just give? I have that gift, you know. Yeah. Well, but I just mean in terms of, you know, were you handing him essentially a story I, to I work could from? Give, or, or I could pages? do it panel by panel, yeah. or I could just do the narrative. And mostly, they don't want it panel by panel. They, they like freedom to, to interpret, yeah. generally. So I can do both, but I, I just, uh, I don't know. I have that gift to visualize the page. Um, Talk about your comics history. I, I too, was raised on comics you know, uh, before discovering, you know, things without <laughs> pictures. Anymore. Well, the, yeah. the comic I loved the most was Captain Marvel because the art. That C.C. Beck. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. In, in other words, Superman was so realistic uh, and so was Batman, but Captain Marvel was... Uh, uh, was was iconic. I mean, was mythic, and uh, I loved, uh, you know, and um, Doctor Sylvana, this crazy guy. <laughs> you know. See, the thing I always loved was for the acronym that made up Shazam. Yeah. Uh, all the all the the power and such comes from Greek and Roman names, yeah. but the smarts comes from Solomon. So the the Jews, yeah. you know, we we manage to give him brains. Everybody else gives him, you know, the power to fly and, and courage and all that, but he needs Jewish brains, and that's you know. It speaks up for us. So I hope so. <laughs> we got Solomon. That's, that's I wouldn't. I, I, it's just that it's uh, when I write the script, and let's say the pages come back to me, I'm overwhelmed. You know, there's such joy, and I don't think of it as mine. I don't. You know, he's the artist, uh, but I think of it as. Um, as magic, you yeah. know, it's really magical. And words, I write some words and they come back as images that I couldn't do. Right. And working Hollywood in terms of trying to do TV or movies? I, I could work for TV. I, I, for cinema, I mean, I've done, uh, you know, a lot of scripts and they were never really that good. Yeah, I, your, your IMDb, the Internet yeah. Movie Database, has nothing. There's like one thing they've got you as a, a writer for. I did I did create a, um, a, a television series based on one of my novels, but it, um, it should have been an enormous success, but the, um, but the actor, um, Ron Silver, I don't know, I think he was having a breakdown while we were doing it. He wasn't very good. That sort of work in was Hollywood a temptation at all, or a distraction in terms of um, your own writing, or was it something you were aspiring to as a next step in terms of your career? Well, first of all, I wasn't thinking of career. Second yeah. of all, I wasn't that interested in money. Everything I did, I wanted it to be. Let's say, if I could have worked with Roman Polanski, if I could have worked uh, with those directors. Uh, with Scorsese, for example, uh, uh, 
I would have been very, very interested, but the idea of earning a lot of money was something that's not going to be that good um, just didn't appeal to me. I tried several times to do things, but they, they never worked out. I could do very well with episodic television now because I know how to do that. And I will be writing the episodes for the... Um, for the graphic version of, of the crime novels. And these are the Isaac Seidel Yeah, yeah. and I will be the executive producer because if you're not, you know... You're out. Yeah, nothing. No one listens to you. Yeah, yeah. I'm I only... was not. And the other, I was just a co-producer. and I didn't realize. So. I didn't realize the power equation. I didn't know enough. I'd never worked in television. Yeah. And uh, Every system is like that. You know, every system, you have to figure out what the hierarchies are and the dynamics, and there's no, it's in no one's interest to teach you beforehand. It, you know, I mean, how would they have made me an executive producer? Yeah, I guess if they were hard up enough, they would have. Hmm. Um, but I wouldn't have been, what you need to be is the showrunner, and they never would have made me the showrunner. No. So can you talk about the balancing act of, we'll say, historical fiction, Crime fiction, auto fiction, memoir, biography. It's a, you, you span a lot of different different forms. Yeah, but again, that, that's always a circumstance. I yeah. mean, Gallimard had a series about the memoir, you know. And so I wrote it. And many of the books started first in France. So let's say The Dark Lady from Belarus, which is the first of the memoirs, was done first in France and then was done here. So um, the book I did on table tennis was done in France first you know, because I was a very serious player and for a while I didn't write that much. I was just playing table tennis. I wanted to get as good as I could be. But you see, there again... Um, this is the trap that you're in. You 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 want to get as good as you can, but you can only reach a certain level. And if you don't understand that... I took up running five or yeah. six months ago. It's been physically and mentally transformative, yeah. but I did my first race a couple of weeks back up in Riverside Park going in knowing this is what I usually run. If I'm yeah. within 30 or 40 seconds of this on either side, I'll be fine. And knowing that the guys who are going to win this are going to be six or seven minutes ahead of me, that there is no world in which a 47-year-old guy is suddenly going to turn into the flash and, and no. be able to go. But was that monomania aspect of ping pong something that, that carries into other it aspects of It was a craft. It was a craft. And, I, you know, first of all, I had a very different style. I couldn't slam with my backhand, so I, I was lucky to have a coach. You know, in China, when you're four or five years old, your coach gives you a racket, especially for you, mm -hmm. you know. And he found, a, I'll, I'll show it to you, in French it's called pico, but um, it, it, you know, in other words, when you play someone for the first time, they have to be damn good if they're going to win because they can't solve your racket. Can't solve this racket if you... Uh, you have to hold... I take a picture of you where, holding this. And what's great is that you have this within five feet of you at any time. Yeah. That's, <laughs> Thank you. So this is just pure rubber pimples. This is the defensive side. And this is pimples plus rubber. So you can be offensive... Um, on the forehand side, but uh, I couldn't slam. So I, w what would happen is that I could take your best shot. I'm going to hit it back. Doesn't matter. You know, I I I You'd always return. Trained with yeah. the champion of the world in France because I was you know writing about ping pong. I, you know, he said let's hit a little bit. He couldn't get past, you know, no matter what he hit. He couldn't. Of course, in a game, I mean, to hit is nothing. I mean, to be in a game, you know, that doesn't, you know, you have to sculpt the game. That's very, very different. But at the level that I played, which was a very, you know, low Paris level, I, you know, I, I, I played very well because they just couldn't solve the racket. 
I mean, it was... <laughs> of course, if someone is really good and they play you a second time, they, they figure solve out. it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but at first, they couldn't. And sadly to say that with age, I've gotten worse. I play with my agent, and he's older than I am, and he gets better. See, I, that's what I don't understand. Huh. He gets better, and I get worse. You know. I was going to go with that Wordsworth line from, uh, uh, oh no, Tennyson's line from Ulysses, though much is taken, much abides, except, you know, on, yeah. on, on a ping pong table. As long as we're talking about origin stories for you and, and we got the whole superhero thing, where did ping pong start for you? I played as a kid. I, I loved, what, what, you see, we don't, rea you have to realize that you're, you're not seeing the ball, you're hearing the ball. Mm-hmm. It's the, it's the sonar. For example, there was once a blind referee who could referee 19, 19 games at the same time, and he would say, table six, that didn't hit, you know. It's, it's the, that's why they would have so much trouble, because they're playing with, pimple, with, with, with sponge, and the sound of my racket is so different that they can't use their sonar. Yeah. And know? they don't... It, are they conscious of that sort of no, echolocation, no or is it just is, something that becomes intuitive? It, it, it's uh, really intuitive. I don't think they would understand it, you know. But um, but when I, did you when did you re-enter that space and and again? Well, to... I I uh, was when I came back from St from Stanford. I, I was married at the time, and we, we broke up. And I came back, and I saw that there was a ping pong club on Ninety Sixth Street, and Marty Reisman, who was one of America's greatest players um, owned the club. It was in a basement on 96th Street. And he was very, very nice. I mean, he, he you know, uh, if there was no one to play with me, he would play with me himself. And uh, he just was the sweetest uh, kind of man and made you feel welcome. So for a while, all I did was play table tennis. Again, I stopped writing. <laughs> And then you but I could only point. reach a certain level, you know. Yeah. Now, with the writing, one never knows. I mean, I'm not you surprise the yourself? judge of my, my, my own work. I only know that this is what I wanted to do, and this is what I could do. Now, it's for other people to say whether it works or not, because I, I, it works for me, but I, I, I mean... I mean, someone would say, okay, this isn't Teddy's voice, it's Jerome Charon's voice. Yes, of course it's not Teddy's voice. I'm not trying to imitate Teddy's voice. I'm just trying to get into his world and bring myself into his world. So it's not the usual kind of historical fiction. It's very, very different. It's postmodern. You know, it's not about Teddy Roosevelt. It's about someone who is like Teddy Roosevelt going through Teddy Roosevelt's world. You know? And what were your influences in that, developing that mode? Was it Barthelme and those guys uh, in terms of the, well, the guys you were peers well, with? Well, I, I, you know? it, it was more an editor. It, when when I, I did a novel, I loved Barthelme, and I was a, a friend of his, you know, and, and I, I really deeply respected his work. But... Um, I had an editor at Norton, Robert Weil, and uh, he was he was on the show this or this past year. He's a, I, I mean, I sat down with him yeah, uh, last he, May. He's he was a wonderful, amazing. wonderful yeah. editor, and um, he helped me sculpt the work and and also this book. I mean, the chapter on Josephine really came from him. So it's a very different kind of historical fiction because uh, it's not Gore Vidal because. Uh, um, and it's not, um, you know, they're, they're great, you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin's historical books are wonderful. I mean, but she doesn't have that black humor. She doesn't have, uh, you know, nor should she. She's not, you know. It's a storytelling the same way. Yeah, she yeah. tells the story beautifully, but I'm reinventing. I'm, I'm, I'm. I don't know how to describe it. I'm, I'm making him as if he were a figure of our age back in that time. Mm -hmm. And how, let's say, 
I'm Alice in this particular wonderland. I'm Alice, I'm going down the rabbit hole and living in that world. You know, that's the way I would put it. And now has that world changed? How do you contrast that world, turn of the century, 19th century? Um, you know, there, there, to... there isn't really that much of it. I know, I mean, when we speak about Trump, um, we should speak about Trumpism. That is what he represents. And he represents something that's really gone wrong and has been wrong for a very, very long time. And that is the disparity of wealth. And it's deepened. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt fought against this. And it's only deepened. And uh, people can't get by, even, let's say, when husbands and wives work. They can barely, everything is so expensive. You know, and uh, so okay, we didn't have the we, we didn't have the the modern technology, but okay, the telephone was new, um, the train carried people um, where they wanted to go, um, but I don't think it's really that different. I mean, there was a privileged few. They sort of ran the country, and I, I'm not sure it's that different. Really. Gilded Age, part and, two. And I think it's, it's becoming unsustainable. I think that the divide in wealth is so great that at some point it, it won't be possible for uh, people to survive. Mm. I, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm very pessimistic. Did you find yourself contrasting Roosevelt with the the current administration? Well, did, were you still writing it in this? this well, era? you know, I have a slightly different take on Trump. Yeah, I think you know um, that what he's done with the tweet is invented a new kind of language. Of course, now we've learned how he, he tweets, and we we can do it better than he can yeah, and process it. And, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, he represents what this country has become. It, you monetize everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is monetized. There, there, there's no sense of value. I mean, how many writers, for example, that you know, other than maybe Stephen King and not even Stephen King, is called upon to speak about what's going on in America? In France, writers are on television all the time. You know, they're... Here, everything is about self-promotion. Yeah. And I don't mean it as a fault of the writers. I mean, yeah. the whole publicity thing is built to sell yeah. books. I mean, ostensibly, that's what we're doing here. But I don't think your publicist was thinking you and I were going to have a digression about LeBron James in the middle of this conversation. No, um, but we're doing it because you're interested in the book. And yeah. uh, also, and, I have and a why. I mean, yeah. I'm always prepared to talk when it's. Yeah, at at a certain level of discussion, you know, uh, I you know it, it's always fun to articulate, and I was a teacher for a very long time, hmm. and I, I taught film, and uh, I loved every class, you know, I always had a good time, and I got the kids to speak. At first, they wouldn't say anything, and then you couldn't shut them up, you know. <laughs> Was that something that distracted from the writing at all, or just a necessary part I, of it? I think, you know, when I, when I went to Paris, uh, I wrote a letter to the American University. Everyone told me they're not hiring anyone, and I said, you know, I can teach this and this, and by the way, I can also teach film. He got in touch with me the next day, and he said, you're going to teach my film courses. So. And how good was your French? Did you terrible, need to? Okay. Terrible, terrible. Did it I, ever mean, get better? I, could, I could do something on television as long as we stick to um, politics or literature, you know, mm. but um, learning the vernacular is, uh, is really difficult. Do you get back at all? Oh, yes, I do. I go back to France once a year, and I, and I stay at a lovely hotel with Lenore, and I go for two weeks, and um, we have a cat, so it's difficult <laughs> Cat is like a child. It's very, very interesting. Uh, the pic there's a picture of her up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and her she's, clop hosts are right here. Yeah, so. and, and 
she becomes more and more dependent on you, you know, so that uh, you really feel bad when you leave her. No, I'm, I'm the same way with my dog. Really? You know, yeah, a, a big greyhound, but there's yeah. a... He stands up in the window outside our house or, you know, looking outside and cries right. when we first leave. Or if my wife leaves to go somewhere, right. he'll just walk right past me, get up in the window and keep looking for her. Um, which suddenly bears into the question, regret not having children? No. No, that's an interesting question. Lenore has two children, two wonderful, wonderful children and, and four uh, incredible grandchildren and uh um, but you see, I had a very, very difficult childhood, and I barely survived it, and I wouldn't have survived it. I, I would have gone insane if it hadn't been for my older brother, who, for whatever reason, loved me. I don't, you know, it's yeah. an irrational thing why someone loves it. He could very well have resented me, because uh, I was his younger brother, I took up a certain attention... But he really loved me, you know, and that saved me. You know, he was more of a parent than my parents. You know. Did he have any resentment about being uh, being converted into to fiction or being used in that way? Oh no, he loved it. Yeah, you no, know, he loved it. I mean, they got him attention at the day job. Or? Oh well, not only that. I mean, I, I helped him <laughs> at the police force too. You know. Um, you know, I interviewed the commissioner, and um, <laughs> it's a strange—it's a strange world. Um, and, uh, and and for a while, he he built a site for my books, and uh, you know, he, he, he's one of the. This is the tragedy. I wouldn't call it a tragedy because that's too strong, but he was much too smart for the world he inhabited. Mm -hmm. And this is the tragedy of many people. And this was as a homicide detective for him? He was a homicide detective, a first grade homicide detective, but uh, he, he he was too smart. You was, know, he just was so smart. Was there a sense of something he should have been doing instead? I don't know. He, he didn't, you know, he didn't. I was the first member of my family who went to college. And I think he might, might have gone to a community college after a while, but... Uh, um, to me, I mean, I don't know how to say this, but I'll say it. When I went to Columbia, and I'm not the only one, I mean, you can ask people who've gone to Columbia at that time. Uh, that defined my life, four years of reading. Okay, I wanted to be a writer, but it wasn't that I wanted to be a successful writer. I wanted to write, to learn how to write. In other words... It gave you the equipment, you know, it formed you in a way so that you didn't really need that much more. Mm -hmm. You know, I needed to learn what was going on in the world. You need friends. But oh, you when had the you foundation. read from the yeah. Greeks, okay, we didn't read. Yeah, was this that core curriculum thing they did, yeah. those, those two yeah. years? First? Yeah. yeah, it was more than the core curriculum because I took, you know, many more courses sure. than that. But that was the I foundation was for everyone. Yeah, and but that, 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 those weren't interesting courses. No. I mean, then you had the colloquium where 10 students, I mean, one is a Nobel Prize winner, one became a president, one became president of the university. These were the, the 10 or 12 best students. And you met with two professors, and generally there was one bright and, and one wasn't so bright. And uh, this is the first time... I, I, I realized that the students were brighter than one of the professors. Mm -hmm. We couldn't keep up with us. We just would, you know, we could analyze books in a way that, uh, you know, I don't know how. Uh, uh, and to me, that was a tremendous gift. It was a wealth, you know. I, I didn't really need much more. Books meant so much to me that I, I didn't care about anything else. You mentioned in a, a past interview that uh, that Hemingway, The Sound and the Fury, and Hundred Years of Solitude were the yeah. only books that had an influence on your writing. And, that, and Waiting for Godot was okay. very, very important. And I wasn't sure if that was, you know, sort of hyperbole at the time or, you know. No, was it wasn't really... hyperbole. I mean, the, the, these books and Lolita, they came at certain moments. Uh, 
and Augie, the Avengers of Augie Mark. See, there's, there's, we've already doubled the list. <laughs> yeah, no, no, there were. Uh, yeah. But the last book that really influenced me was A Hundred Years of Solitude. Now, that may be my fault. Did you see it? Did you see your writing change distinctly after? Was absolutely. That, huh. Absolutely. Do you have any way of characterizing how that changed? Well, or was you, it just a, you, the, the musicality of, of... Quote, realism went out the window. You yeah. know, you could take anyone anywhere. You know, That's, And that, that was just a wonderful book, the way it starts. I mean, and it's in translation. You, it's very hard to read books in translation. I read Proust in translation, and I just didn't work for me, you know. I hear there's a great, there's a much better translator now. There was a series of them being done, a different translator for each volume, but because of our bullshit copyright issues in the U.S., yeah. I think only the first two could come out in the U.S., but the other four are in the U.K., so... Well, there's one woman who's also a novelist who's translated. Yeah, she. I think she's the one who did... Um, she translated Flaubert also. She did Madame yeah. Bovary, uh, blanking on her name, which is a sign of what a bad person I am. Um, but that sense of, of influence really kind of crystallized early for you? And well, Joyce was the first influence, the, yeah. the complete musicality that he had. And then reading William Gass. I was always interested in the music, and to me, the music was the meaning. You know, and certainly, even beyond Gass's fiction, Gass's essays, yeah. which never exactly cohere as intellectual essays, but are so absolutely gorgeous to read. Yeah, um, this essay on the color blue. Is yeah, just, that one's uh, yeah unbelievable. And Bartholomew's stories, uh, you know, the way he, he was able to shift language and really tear language apart. Uh, make fun of language. Uh, he was unique. I mean, had you wanted to take your fiction to that extreme, or again, no, were you always no, no. embedded I mean, in story? I, I was first asked, and foremost? you know, would you want to, to have been another writer? Uh, in in one of the questions, you know, we're having a blog tour, and oh, yeah. the blog was asked if you could be another writer, and I said no. I, I mean, the only the only thing. Where you, the only thing is, I wish I could have written Hamlet. Yeah, well. Something, you know, <laughs> but that's the only one. Yeah. Not Moby Dick, not Lolita, Hamlet. And also, I was in Emily Dickinson's room, and that was wonderful. But visiting uh, Van Gogh's garret, you know, is, is uh, the room where he lived and worked was... Uh, devastating you know it really I was crying you know just the loneliness the isolation and the ability to work in that isolation was uh, so moving to me I mean he is and you know he didn't paint that long he only painted for a few years he was a preacher and the fact that um he had no success at all and still worked with that intensity. And there's another painter, Basquiat, I don't know if yeah. you know his work, who has, to me, I mean, people say it's a pity that he died. Yes, of course, it's a pity that anyone died, but he was used up. I mean, the mind was moving, was sparking in so many directions that in the last two, three years of his life, he didn't paint at all. You, I don't think he would have painted again. If you look at any of his paintings, they, they go everywhere. Yeah. It's just extraordinary. And you've stayed creatively engaged this whole time. I mean, you had your, your lulls, like your, your ping-pong era and such. I, I, I don't know how to, how to answer that. I mean, my life consists primarily of Lenore, the cat, and doing research for the books I intend to write. Do I read contemporary fiction? Not very much. I was a judge for the National Book Award, and I really liked the young, young writers. I thought they were incredible, but they wouldn't have influenced me. Yeah. No. I mean, the way Gass influenced, the way Bartholomew 
I don't know, maybe there are writers out there who would, but um, I'm not. I'm not curious. You see, I, I read everything at one point. When, when it was, was possible John to... Bar, when it was John Barth. I mean, yeah. when I heard about a writer, I would immediately read that. You know, and, uh, do um, you see your influence on other writers? Or do other writers tell you... More so in France. I think yeah. a lot of people were uh, here. It, it's really hard to tell. But in France, writers would say that... Uh, they were influenced by my crime novels. They hadn't seen anything like it. They're weird. I, I, I'm only halfway through the first quartet of yeah. Isaac Seidel novels, and um, there's such a strange jump from the first to the second uh, that I'm, I'm absolutely compelled now. And in fact, I picked up another edition of it because I had a paperback right. that the first time I tried opening it wide, the spine yeah. completely exploded. So you'll be signing that one when we, uh, we, okay. we finish up. But... but Remember, the, the second one is a prequel because yeah. Colin die, I mean, Manfred dies. You, you almost never have a hero dying in the middle of a book. Yeah. And then the opening lines of the second, of the one, second one Blue Eyes. Yeah. Blue Eyes, you know. So, I mean, that was purposeful. Yeah. It, it, you resurrect him. And you can always, sure, I could have resurrected him in the future, but you see, I didn't want to do that, so I had a prequel. Yeah, you know. I just mean it's it's a tighter second novel than the first one, as though you'd figured something out about the the form uh, between the first. I, and I second. really don't know. This, I mean, when we this speak, happened around my birth, so yeah. I don't expect you to remember too much of the. No, the I mean you know. when you speak of form, form is. Uh, I guess maybe the rules is intuitive. Uh, I mean, it, it, the structure is. Uh, you know the skeleton of a book. If, if if the form is too apparent, it destroys the energy. The, the in other in other words, you put the flesh on the structure, and the flesh has to hide the structure because any time the structure reveals itself, there's a kind of falseness yeah. to the book. So you don't want the structure to be seen, though it has to be there. You know? okay. And of course, you know, Faulkner, I mean, we did mention The Sound of the Fury. Yeah. So you mentioned going to Van Gogh's garret. Are you a um, pilgrimage person? No. Do, do you tend to... Okay. No, 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 I, I, I am not. I did want to see Emily Dickinson's room because I was writing a novel about her. Um, but um, That sort of literary tourism, no, but was, in a pilgrim. I was you know, given a, a private, you know, yeah. I was able to go in the room privately. But I I didn't feel her presence because remember it's it's more more or less like a museum yeah so it's a little bit changed but I think Van Gogh's room is exactly the way it was when he lived there and there's nothing in it it's just a bed and a dresser a tiny window like a turret um, and somehow. And, you, and there's a restaurant that's still there, and you see where he ate and ate alone. Um, I hear there's a new movie coming out about... Yeah, yeah know, Julian Schnabel Julian made a... Julian Schnabel. Yeah. Uh, no. I like his films very much. A friend of mine marveled over how he can make good films about art, even though his art itself isn't good, but <laughs> I have no, I no gauge of Schnabel's art. I wouldn't uh, say art that his that. art... It's it, my friend is an opinionated no, artist. No, but, it, it's yeah. just that he was too much an artist of his time, and it didn't... That sort of art he, didn't carry. You know, in that era, Mary Boone was, you know, you wanted to... She, she had the gallery that had most of the, of the interesting artists, and, and so art became commerce. And it's no accident that many of these artists became movie makers because they had nowhere, they, they had nowhere to go with their art. But I love Schnabel's uh, uh, films. I think yeah. he's a great filmmaker. Did your parents get a grasp of your success? No, no. And did uh, they live long enough and would they have understood that you were actually no. building a... Okay. No, and they wouldn't have... They... they Appreciated what you know, um, 
that you weren't asking them for money. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true that my mother did give me some money when I moved to Europe. It was very generous of her. You know, she knew I would have a hard time. And um, she did what she could, you know. You know I, had a, I had a hard time with my parents. Yeah. Yeah, and you've documented yeah. you know. that. I just wasn't sure if they ever had a moment of, oh, he's... He's writing books. We understand, you know, that he's he's found his path. No, I, I don't think they... Um, it wasn't their world. Yeah. Know? They didn't... Uh, and they couldn't have read them. So no. what, what, would, what would it mean to them? What's your writing like? Writing practice, I mean... Well, you, I see the computer um, over here, but I have no idea if you... I have two computers. I yeah. mean, I write on the one in the other room. And then they also have two completely different views. And I, I don't, you yeah. know, they are here. Here you have the air conditioner, so I... Yeah, but you still see out. Yeah. But with the air conditioner, I don't have this open view. But the, the other, you know, this is the corner of the building, so the other... You, you can come and take, yeah, take, we'll take a look take after. A look. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah. And that's the view I prefer when I write, even though I'm having trouble with the computer and I probably will have to get another one. Um, I um, play table tennis probably from two to four times a week. Um, I'm now on the board of managers of the building because I had to be, I mean, you know, there were, I felt we were losing control of the, of the building, so I, I ran for the board and I happened to win. So that will take up a certain amount of time. But other than that, my head is solely in the writing. You know, even when I'm not writing, I'm still writing. The, you know, your mind is still in the text, you know, you know, see, it's, it's strange because here we're talking about Teddy and my mind is totally in Salinger, yeah. you know, but so it's like visiting, uh, a, not a graveyard because I'm, no, we have a physical book, yeah. but you're looking you know, back at it instead of, I'm looking yeah. back at it because I'm no longer writing it because I'm finishing off the, the Salinger, you know. Letters or uh, lessons from Roosevelt? Is there anything you took out of what you learned about him? Well, um, more about his father. I mean, about uh, the humility that his father had. You know, his father was came from a wealthy family, and the fact that he was so concerned about the poor was was very touching to me you know and um about teddy roosevelt himself he was probably our greatest peacetime president uh, but it's filled with contradictions i mean for example here's a game hunter um who did the greatest act of preservation of all times. Yeah. You know, there, there's just so many contradictions, you know. Um, um, but you, you don't lionize him by any means. I mean, you, you include, uh, you, you have him regretting things, but yes, still committing he, the horrible... He really did. You know, the he behavior treated with his brother, his and, brother horribly, yeah. and, and that... Those scenes also moved me when when, when he separated um, Elliot from his, his children and his wife and and um, Eleanor, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt basically grew up as an orphan because of him. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure his wife would have died. I mean, Elliot's wife would have died if they had been together. You know, but Teddy thought. Um, you know, um, it was for the best. What was, what was for the best. I mean, was he right? Was he wrong? I don't, I don't know. Roosevelt today? You talk about him as a peacetime president, and we're in a perpetual state of war, although we sometimes don't know what we're at war with. Well, if we had someone like, you know, you know someone like Teddy 
remember, it, I hate to be pessimistic, but it is a dying planet. And the lack of equality grows deeper and deeper. And it's not, the planet is, is very soon not going to be sustainable. And if we had someone like Teddy as president, I think he would have at least made a valiant effort to change that. To preserve whatever we could and to understand that you can't have a world where there's such a divide in wealth. And this is what he fought. When he fought against the, the big corporations and, uh, and their power. I mean, he really, uh, uh, he was hated by members of his own party. Remember, they tried to get rid of him. They gave him the vice presidency because he was being dumped. Yeah. And then suddenly McKinley dies. And his great regret is that he could have run for a third time. But he thought Taft would follow his program, and Taft just became programmic Republican, you know, yeah. a member of the party. And, uh, and also, if he hadn't been shot, he might have beaten Wilson, you know, we don't know. You know, he was shot in... October, so we had three or four weeks of campaigning, and it's possible he might have won. Last thing, can we get together to talk about Salinger and the Lakers when that book comes out? Sure. sure. Sounds good. Jerome, thanks so much for coming on. Oh, you're very welcome. And that was Jerome Charrett. His new book is The Perilous Adventures of the Cowboy King a novel of Teddy Roosevelt and his times from Live Right Publishing. Just came out this week. And if you email me at groth18 at gmail.com or leave a comment on this episode's webpage at chimeraobscura.com slash VM, you'll be entered to win a free copy of this book and Jerome's Abraham Lincoln novel. Now you can check out more of Jerome's work through his website, jeromecharon.com. That's J E R O M E. C H A R Y N dot com. He's on Twitter as Jerome Charon, all one word, and his novel is also on Twitter as Cowboy King T R, also all one word. As I mentioned, he's written a lot of books. Um, for me, uh, The Magician's Wife, his his first graphic novel is just so, so gorgeous. And the first four Isaac Seidel crime novels, which he says are being adapted into an animated series, um, they're, they're fantastic. Now, after we wrapped, I asked Jerome, so, who are you reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The third quarter 2018 episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Moby, Audrey Niffenegger, Mark Ulrichson, David Lloyd, Glenn David Gold, Ken Crimstein, Hal Mayforth, Lance Richardson, and Nathaniel Popkin. I will get the fourth quarter episode up soon. I was just kind of bleh last weekend when I should have been doing it. Anyway, I promise it'll be there soon. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. And there are all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, which are weird to look at, my secret project, which I feel guiltier and guiltier about, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode at Jerome's apartment in Chelsea and that mean or West Village really. That means 10 or 11 bucks for the toll at the GW, another 30 bucks for parking, another 6 bucks for the subway. It adds up. So, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show like travel, web hosting, equipment, coffee, or if you just want to toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Joe Caruso, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Paul Karasik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Lescamella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, 
Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Noah Van Skyver, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should check out our episode with Hal and check out his music over on soundcloud.com slash Mayforth, M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Peter Cooper, author of the new comics collection, Kafkaesque. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, tell social media, and go to iTunes. Look up the Virtual Memory Show and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 